Hi, I'm James Ganey, and welcome to A History of Infection, Part 2, Tuberculosis. What do 9,000-year-old remains tell us about infection? Just how widespread are infections? And for that matter, what is an infection? The study of what makes us ill can be broken down broadly into three different categories. We have infection by some agent, then we have genetic diseases, such as cystic fibrosis, and lifestyle diseases, such as cancers caused by smoking. But not everything fits nicely into one of these three subdivisions. For example, some cancers are caused by viruses acting on pre-existing genetic and environmental conditions. In this series, I'll be talking about pathogens quite a lot. A pathogen is normally a microscopic organism that's capable of causing an infection inside a host. Again, this can get a bit confusing because not all are microscopic organisms, because some of them are bigger, and some actually aren't even alive, like viruses and, again, prions. Infectious agents, again, can broadly be split into five distinct different categories. We have bacteria, viruses, protozoa, fungi, and, again, prion or prion diseases. But what is an infection? It's not as simple as having a non-living or non-self organism inside your body, because that happens all the time. Currently, we are colonised by billions, if not trillions, of bacteria, and they're not technically infecting us. It's all to do if there's a competing interest involved. So to define infection, I would say that there has to be some sort of parasitic relationship between a host and a parasite. And this parasite, be it bacteria, viral, or as we would call other parasites, has to have some way of spreading from one host to another. With this, we incorporate 99% of all known infections. Different diseases have different progressions. In a later episode, we'll be looking at how the four different kinds of parasite that cause malaria each have their own different symptoms. This is normally due to how the parasite interacts and exploits the host. If you understand that an infection is a parasite trying to exploit its host, then you understand in some way what an infection actually is. So possibly one of the oldest recorded diseases that we know of is tuberculosis. This is caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Nice and easy to say. Prior to a effective treatment, tuberculosis killed about 50% of the people who got an active infection. The oldest case we know of are from 9,000 year old remains of an infant and a woman. They both show classic signs of tuberculosis infection on their bones, and when scientists extracted DNA from these bones and looked for the tuberculosis genome, they found fragments of it in these 9,000 year old remains. 9,000 years ago is around the same time that humans were just beginning to learn how to farm and settling down into communities. This means that the tuberculosis bacterium would have had a much larger community to work with, or at least a more stable community. Tuberculosis is a very interesting property where it only requires a very small population to actually maintain an infection in that population. Something such as measles requires several thousands of people to be able to maintain themselves and not go extinct by infecting people and then them becoming immune to it. But you don't tend to become immune to tuberculosis. If you catch it, you can catch it again and again and again. So it only requires a few hundred people to maintain an active infection. In 1500 BCE, the Egyptians were writing about and trying to treat TB. To them, this was a disease that spared no one regardless of your station. Queen Nefertiti and her husband both died of what we think was TB. The preferred method of treatment for TB in ancient Egypt was to lance cysts and then apply a sort of a mixture of acacia sea bark, uh, peas, fruit and mixed blood from animals and insects and honey. Now acacia sea and honey are both known to actually have antimicrobial effects, although this probably wouldn't have saved too many people, but it, it was going along the right sort of lines towards a treatment. So how does TB actually make you ill? Tuberculosis could be known as a professional pathogen. Its entire life cycle revolves around it trying to exploit its host. What TB does is it gets inside your lungs, and inside your lungs it infects the very parts of your immune system that are there to try and protect you from infection. Your lungs are an open environment to the atmosphere, so they have to have quite strong defences from things getting inside. Normally this works quite well. If you get a bit of dirt or something else in your lung, macrophages come along and engulf it and break it down, saving you from being infected by it. TB works by infecting the very cells, macrophages, that are there as your immune response in your lung. Macrophages go around, as the name would suggest, engulfing things and degrading them so they're no longer a threat. But being the professional pathogen it is, the TB has learned how to reproduce inside your macrophages. If you look at the slide of a person infected with TB, you can see that the purple dots are actually the TB bacterium inside macrophages. Around the outside, you might notice that there's another sort of cell. These are lymphocytes, and they're actually packing the infected macrophages into a ball to stop them from spreading. This outside layer is then replaced later on by fibrotic tissue or scar tissue. These form big necrotic legions inside infected people's lungs, which can actually be spat up and coughed out later on with infective TB all over them. This is one of the ways that TB is actually dangerous to people. Your immune system packs away these infected macrophages leading to necrotic tissue forming and actually killing large pockets of your lung. 
in some cases, TB can actually spread to other parts of the body, such as your bone or your brain. Here's a video of a surgery performed in the 1930s of a young man having tuberculosis removed from his brain. You'll notice the surgeon isn't wearing gloves, so I'm not sure how sterile this entire procedure was. I've put a link in the description below for the full video. Nowadays, this would probably be treated by antibiotics to begin with. If those were unsuccessful due to multiple drug resistance TB, then surgery would be an option. The recommended treatment of TB is a course of three different antibiotics for up to nine months. This is why it's such an issue for health organisations around the world, because it's just impossible to treat the number of people who are infected with TB for this long with this many antibiotics. You might think that TB is an old or at least a third world problem, but you'd be wrong. TB is actually on rise throughout the UK, Europe and America. It's reliably reported that nearly 2 billion people are actually infected with TB worldwide at this moment. Only about 10% of these people actually have an active case of TB, but that's still 200 million people who require treatment for TB. TB is also a big worry for immune compromised people as it's the leading cause of death in HIV positive people. These two seem to go really well together to exacerbate the conditions of both, HIV allowing TB into the lungs and TB activating the virus giving the person full blown AIDS. So that leads us on nicely to our next topic, HIV and its surprisingly long history. I hope you'll join me then. If you've enjoyed this feel free to like and comment and uh, subscribe if you want to keep seeing more of these and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.